Uh, good afternoon, everybody. This, my name is Hart Sapoy. I'm the president of National Trust Foundation. Thank you very much for being with us, especially in a day where many events in DC have been cancelled because everyone's scared of Corona, so you're great to strive to be here. Uh, thank you. Right before our panel starts, I'd like to uh, just tell you some rules to make things smooth. Uh, each speaker will speak for 10 to 12 minutes, uh, and then we'll open the door for uh, Q&A. Uh, anyone with a question, please introduce yourself. Your affiliation, be short, try to the point, try not to give a lecture, just ask your question. So uh, we give opportunity for everyone to ask their questions. And uh, Hamdi will be moderating the event. He'll introduce our speaker, and I'd like to thank Hamdi for helping organize this event. Put the panel together. Thank you very much. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, we have all done a good job on the Syrian uh, revolution. Uh, it's been going on, they ignored um, now by uh, international media. So we'll try to discuss this issue. If anyone have comment or question, please uh, direct it short and right to the point. There's some point. Good afternoon. Thank you all for coming. I could introduce them according to the Twitter comments, but I don't think any of them will like that. There, there was a couple of pretty interesting ones this morning. One of them in particular, a Russian bot number four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, said that we are the four most wrong people in Washington, D.C. But I, I didn't really want to include myself in that group. However, I'm going to say that these are three of the most correct people in Washington, D.C., and we're honored to have them. Charles Lister has been uh, monitoring and analyzing 
uh, on Syrian issues for quite some time, especially mm -hmm. obviously in uh, the area of counterterrorism. And we're honored to have him today. Uh, Hassan Hassan uh, is also one of the foremost leaders in the area. He uh, co authored a book, ISIS, uh, with Michael Weiss, and is, of course, uh, one of the uh, most influential in this issue of modern Syria, and is, of course, himself originally Syrian. So I'm very grateful for his appearance here today. And then Jenny Caparello on the end there. Although she's last, she's she's most definitely not least. She is from the Institute for the Study of War. I understand she's the director now. Congratulations on your promotion. You. It's uh, very well deserved. Thank you. So at that, I am going to um, just make one minor correction. I understand that we have question cards for you to write questions on, and I think they're going to be distributed at some point. Uh, and that is only because we want to be able to hear from the three panelists as much as possible. So at some point we're going to pass out cards and ask you to write brief questions on them so that the, the panelists can answer those. And with that, I'm going to hand off the microphone to Charles Lister. Thank you all for being here. Okay, thank you so much um, uh, for having me. National Interest Foundation. Um, thank you for all, all, all of you for coming on this important day. Um, kind of extraordinary to think that we're now in the tenth year um, of this uh, unprecedented crisis. But uh, never more important to continue to discuss these issues uh, and to try to tackle um, the, the various policy challenges that they pose. So we had a brief discussion just behind uh, behind all of you earlier about what we're going to cover. So hopefully there won't be too much. Uh, overlap. Uh, I thought I'd start by uh, uh, talking about the situation in the northwest of Syria. Obviously, the big uh, ongoing development has hit the hit, has actually managed to hit uh, some Western media attention over the last week or so. Um, I think suffice to say, um, the humanitarian crisis in Idlib is totally unprecedented. It's unprecedented in, in nine plus years of the crisis in Syria, but also it's the biggest humanitarian crisis. The, the world has seen um, for decades, uh, potentially going as far back as the Second World War. Um, the scale, uh, sorry, the scale is one thing, but the speed with, with, with which that humanitarian crisis has escalated um, has placed the international community, the United Nations, uh, INGOs in, a, in an extremely tricky bind. Uh, the UN has made it very clear it has essentially run out of emergency funds um, to, to deal with the crisis. Um, with one million people being displaced in 85 days to an area that was already home to 850,000 uh, displaced people, uh, to IDP camps that were already two or three times beyond their capacity. Um, you can only imagine the challenges that, uh, that the UN and other international actors face. Um, one brief note, uh, just to put on people's radars, is that the UN Security Council will be voting this summer, early this summer, I think, um, on the continued uh, availability of cross-border aid access. Um, the opening, uh, or the continued opening uh, of the Bab al-Hawa crossing into Italy uh, is and will be up for question. Uh, my understanding, talking to people who have been involved in some of these sort of preliminary discussions in the UN, um, is that there hasn't until now been a great deal of urgency from the US, uh, the UK, France as uh, Security Council members um, in terms of preempting this, uh, this vote, or at least in terms of preempting uh, what we saw last year, which was the closure of a number of other significant border crossings, uh, including in the Northeast. Um, but going back to the, the situation that we've seen unfold just in the last few weeks, um, beginning on December the 1st last year, uh, the regime relaunched hostilities. The first phase began in April uh, 2019. Um, and whereas that first phase last year uh, saw the regime inch forward, uh, since December, the scale, the speed at which the regime was advancing was fairly significant. Um, and that has placed Turkey uh, specifically into a much more uh, tricky national security crisis. Um, for President Erdogan, for the AKP party, um, the fate of Idlib, in my opinion, is existential. Um, domestically, there seems to be near unanimity. Um, 
in Turkish politics against the prospect of greater numbers of Syrian refugees entering Turkey. Uh, the pressure, as we saw last year with the incursion into northeastern Syria, is actually to start encouraging Syrian refugees to return to Syria. So having two, nearly two million IDPs squeezed on a shut for now uh, Turkish border um, is a major crisis for uh, President Erdogan's political future. And I think that's why we saw the somewhat unprecedented uh, intervention Operation Spring Shield uh, launched on March the 1st. Um, a primarily drone-led campaign, which for military analysts was an interesting thing to, to, to watch unfold. Um, integrating a lot of electronic warfare, another um, from a military aspect, interesting thing to, to test. Um, certainly I think some people were surprised uh, on the defense side over here in the US at the extent to which Turkey was capable of neutralizing uh, Russian-made uh, air defense systems. Uh, both from, from the air in terms of jamming tech capabilities, but also in terms of actually taking them out. Um, but in this, in, to, to cut a very long story short, the significant regime advances that we saw up to uh, March the 1st um, almost came to a standstill following Turkey's intervention. Um, the losses incurred by, uh, incurred by Turkish action on, this, on the Syrian army in particular were very significant. Uh, I think you've probably all seen lists uh, published by the Turkish uh, government. The US government disagrees with some of those higher end numbers, um, but nevertheless, uh, the numbers on the US side in terms of what's assessed to have taken place is significant for the Syrian army, which as everyone knows who's been following Syria has been suffering in terms of resources and manpower for, for a long time. Um, in terms of manpower, Turkish strikes were killing roughly 60 Turkish soldiers, uh, sorry, Syrian soldiers uh, a day um, from March the 1st to March the 5th, um, which by itself um, on one concentrated front line um, or theater uh, was, was also similarly very significant. So here's the kind of tricky mystery in people's minds right now. Turkey essentially rearranged the power equation on the ground. Um, we were seeing policemen being deployed by the Syrian military to the front lines because they had quite literally run out of manpower. Their advances had stalled, been put on pause, and some of them even were slowly being rolled back. Then came this summit in Moscow last week between President Erdogan and President Putin. Um, and two things were agreed. One was a ceasefire, which was just about the least surprising development um, because that was, that was entirely predictable leading up to the summit. But the second one was a secure corridor running along the M4 highway, which I don't know if we've necessarily got it, but an exact map which we'll be able to talk about this, but it is essentially the M4 runs right through the middle of Idlib, east to west, west to east, uh, and cuts the province in half. Um, but more than that, it's the M4, the opposition controls about 25 kilometers of territory south of the M4. So Turkey and Russia had suddenly agreed to give the Russians essentially full control of territory south of the M4, um, which was somewhat puzzling, uh, appears to be a significant concession um, on the Turkish side, um, and raises very significant question marks as to how exactly this is going to be implemented, how is the opposition going to cede this territory. The Turkish foreign minister was on TV this morning and said um, that that territory south of the M4 will fall under Russian um, sort of governorship. Um, so very significant puzzling questions, which most of us analysts, I think, are somewhat confused by uh, in terms of how that's going to be implemented. Um, but the signaling from a Turkish perspective won't have gone unnoticed in Moscow. Um, the signaling is very clearly that the M4 highway is the red line. Um, in, two week, in the two weeks prior to Turkey's intervention, um, in the two weeks prior to Turkey's intervention, um, mo the vast majority of Turkey's military deployments into Idlib were to establish new observation posts along the M4. So even prior to Turkey's military operations, um, the red line was being drawn on the map. This is ultimately where the Turkish government may be willing to sort of press pause, reach a compromise with the Russians. Um, we can all debate whether or not the Russians will actually be willing to agree to something like that or not. Um, but the signaling, I think, is clear going forward. Um, I have no idea how I'm doing time-wise. I'm re really doing this off the cuff. Um, so give me a nudge if I'm, if I'm running out of time. I'll look forward now.
Um, we're technically in a ceasefire, although it's a very imperfect one. Um, violations began literally from the first minute um, of the ceasefire and have continued. Um, over the weekend, pro-regime forces captured two, two villages uh, from the opposition in Jabal Zawiya area in southern Idlib. What was interesting, though, was that the Russian military intervened and forced those pro-regime forces to withdraw and hand back those two villages to the opposition. So clearly, the Russians and the Turks have an immediate vested interest in seeing this ceasefire sustained. Uh, I guess the question is really is, is to what end and for how long. Um, uh, my uh, cynicism or scepticism on this issue is still founded in the idea that hostilities will resume at some point. Uh, the, the idea of a compromise solution that splits it in half with the northern half remaining under de facto Turkish opposition and jihadist control goes against everything the Syrian regime stands for in terms of its motto of taking back every inch of Syrian territory. Um, so, so the future still looks fairly grim. Uh, the crisis, the humanitarian crisis remains much the same, but it does unfortunately look set to, to get worse. Um, the best best scenario I can envision right now is one that I and others have called the Gazification um, of Idlib. Now that's a pretty grim uh, scenario to envision, um, but there are not a great deal of good options left uh, uh, in this in this challenge. Okay, I'm just going to leave the Gazification to the question because I think that requires some special attention and we're running a little over time. Am I? Okay. I'm going to ask Hassan Hassan to say a few Sorry. words as well. <laughs> Uh, thank you for uh, national interest for inviting me and thanks uh, for uh, Just to start, I, uh, you know, if I cough, it's, uh, it's nothing to do with Corona. It's uh, it's the pollen season. I, I, I did check. Uh, so uh, I want to kind of go a little bit uh, big picture and, and talk about how uh, the Idlib triggered uh, a few kind of. Uh, uh, dynamics in Syria that might become more and more uh, uh, interesting and important in the coming years, which is uh, the roles of countries like Iran and Turkey, and how the, the kind of uh, when you know people uh, following the Syrian conflict, they all, especially over the past say since 2017, maybe 16, 17, uh, after Aleppo, people thought that. Uh, the outcome of the Syrian uh, uh, conflict has been decided and that uh, regime control is count, uh, going to be the eventual sort of outcome for the Syrian conflict because it, in, it incrementally happened uh, ceasefire, uh, ceasefire after ceasefire. Uh, but recently, I think with Idlib, uh, new things started to kind of uh, raise their heads. And I, uh, for, uh, one thing I want to kind of focus on, uh, Charles spoke about uh, Turkey, and how Turkey is becoming more uh, involved in the Syrian conflict. People underestimated, for example, how Tur how invested Turkey is uh, in northern Syria. This is nothing to do with the Syrian conflict. This is, uh, or even the kind of the four decade uh, war with the PKK, or kind of the way, if you understand that, or you understand the uh, the four uh, year, uh, four decade kind of conflict with uh, with the PKK. Uh, that doesn't explain well what Turkey or how Turkey is thinking. Uh, Turkey is also uh, learning the lessons of Iraq. Uh, when the Iraq war happened in 2003, uh, Turkey uh, had choices. Uh, that was before even Erdogan, Erdogan started to kind of define uh, the uh, Turkish foreign policy. Uh, so this is a Turkish core interest rather than uh, Erdogan kind of specific uh, ambitions to uh, secure areas uh, like the northern, uh, northern Syria in the same way they, they wanted to do in Iraq but they fail. And the, and, and the last thing they want to do is basically replicate uh, what happened in Iraq, where uh, the PKK or other forces take over that area and Turkey has no influence. Now Turkey is trying to kind of step in early and make sure that nobody can take uh, Turkey out of Syria, including uh, Russia. So what we saw over the past two weeks, three weeks, is the end of this honeymoon sort of period between Russia and Turkey, which happened exact, almost exactly four years ago. Uh, when these two countries started to work together closely and in some ways uh, for in, 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 in the Turkish situation uh, against the uh, American uh, policy in Syria. They defined their alliance with, uh, with uh, Russia uh, versus or vis-a-vis -vis, um, or in, in, a, in opposition to basically the American policy in Syria. Uh, 
this has shaped uh, Turkish policy <coughs> that they wanted to stay in Syria, and the only way for them to stay in the game in Syria was to align themselves with Russia. That has not changed. I think Turkey will continue to be an ally of a strategic ally of uh, Russia inside Syria. Uh, but what we saw over the past three weeks is that Turkey uh, started to say, you know what, I can uh, or uh, I, I can go against uh, Russia. So the competitiveness, the rivalry between Russia and, and, and Turkey also starts to surface. So uh, on one hand, Turkey wants to reassert itself and make sure that its presence in Syria, nobody messes with it. Uh, and they saw the offensive in Idlib as a kind of a beginning of the end of their presence in Syria. That's why they freaked out. And that's why they went out and hit it. Uh, all in and all out uh, against uh, the Russian-backed uh, Syrian forces there. So that's one dynamic you have to keep in mind, that Russia, uh, Turkey is here to stay, regardless of what happens to some of the details about who takes uh, Sarakib and who doesn't take Sarakib, that kind of little towns here and there. But Turkey is going to stay, uh, I imagine, uh, looking at also Eastern Syria and uh, other, other uh, dynamics in Syria for at least another decade where Turkey will have some sort of presence in Syria. Uh, shifting to kind of Iran, also important because what we saw is that kind of beginning of the rivalry between Turkey and Russia, but in a hybrid way where they also aligned. It's kind of a, it's, a, it's, a, it's contradictory, but it's not the way they, they, they the balance between these two dynamics. Uh, I think also we will start to see the beginning of kind of rivalry between Turkey and Iran in Syria. Uh, today in Syria, I, I would say that uh, Iran is having a very tough time. It's probably the worst time for Iran and Syria for uh, a few reasons. One is obviously the American policy uh, against Iran and maximum pressure, the economic strangula strangulation against the Assad regime. And uh, Iran doesn't seem to have to, to be able to catch a breath because of that kind of economic strangulation, uh, if you like, uh, in Syria and in Iran and elsewhere in the region. So there's pressure from the US, but also there are realities in the Middle East, regardless of uh, American policy that's actually there are playing against Iran, uh, not just in Syria, not just in Iraq, not in Lebanon, also uh, throughout the region. One is basically what I wrote last year very quickly uh, uh, about the decline in the sectarianism in the region. We've seen probably the lowest level of sectarianism in the region in four decades uh, for different, you know, uh, many factors I'm not going to go into uh, now. And that's playing obviously against uh, Iran. Where we saw in Iraq a nationalist movement that's playing against the Hashd al-Shabi, against Iranian militias uh, in Iraq, uh, the kind of nationalist or cross sectarian sort of uh, uh, protest in, in Lebanon also has something to do with uh, with Iran and uh, Iranian uh, presence in Syria. Although it's kind of too late for for that to affect Hezbollah, for example, because it's a well advanced uh, as, a, as a kind of a proxy uh, model. But in Syria, particularly, I think uh, the killing of Qasem Soleimani. A lot of people thought about, you know, the killing of Qasem Soleimani and how whether he was uh, replaceable or uh, irreplaceable in, uh, in, the, in Iran. I think that missed the point. Uh, the point was not just the killing of Qasem Soleimani. I think that was a big deal, and that's an important event. Uh, I think people, future historians, would look at it as a kind of a, a defining moment uh, in the in the Middle East, or one of the defining moments of the Middle East. Uh, but also the, these other trends that I've been talking about. Uh, as Qasem Soleimani was killed, as Iran is facing all this uh, pressure across the region, as these trends are happening in the region, the Assad regime needs Iran less today. So Iran's ability to replicate the Iraq scenario of building an army of proxies in Syria is becoming less and less uh, plausible uh, because the war has uh, winded down. Essentially, that uh, the Assad regime now can rely on Russia. It will rely, I think, will continue to depend uh, to a certain degree on Iran, but I don't think in a way uh, in a way that will help Iran replicate what happened in Iraq. I think Iran's example in Iraq worked because not just because of the Iraq war and that kind of 19-year-old, uh, sorry, kind of uh, uh, almost two decades kind of war uh, in Iraq, but also two uh, prior de decades in uh, in the region where some of these leader, uh, the militias that were uh, that worked very closely with Iran had. Uh, a prior relationship with uh, with Iran. So essentially, Iran had a longer time uh, working on these uh, proxies in Iraq than it had in Syria. And uh, the Assad regime, the last thing it wants now uh, is to allow Iran to take over fully. Uh, 
so I think that's kind of some of the dynamics that we, we kind of keep, uh, have to keep, uh, keep an eye on, not just what was happening here and there uh, on a daily basis, the big picture. Thank you, Hassan. And I think uh, Jenny is going to be talking about the SDF, uh, YPG, PKK, and Northeast region in general. Great, thanks. Um, and thank you and the NIH for having me, for having me here today. Uh, I'm going to offer some thoughts on the trajectory of the Northeast, as was mentioned, as well as where the U.S. policy is and is likely headed. Um, it will connect back to what's happening in the West because, of course, you actually can't separate all these problems, not the least of which because the Turks are a major actor now, both in the Northwest and in the Northeast, but also because America has vital interests at stake in what's happening in Italy, even if we're not acting on it. Um, and it will relate to what is achievable with our presence and our, our local partners in Northeastern Syria. I think Hassan mentioned something at the start of his comments that I'd like to reiterate and reinforce, which is that I think there's a tendency by a lot of observers to frame what's happening in Syria from the prism of what kind of outcome of the war are we approaching. I think that's understandable for a lot of reasons, because a lot of very big diplomatic efforts are focused on the end of the war, and there's a lot of language to that effect even between the Turks and the Russians as they're negotiating what is actually military uh, options on the ground but also because this has been a decade-long conflict. Um, we're all exhausted. Syria has suffered in incredible pain, and it's it's absolutely devastating that this war is, is not approaching a conclusion. And I offer that framing because I think that the U.S., from a policy perspective, continues to struggle with how do we frame an approach to the Syrian conflict that acknowledges that there can be no solution short of a Syria-wide solution, right? That we're not gonna partition Syria that has never been in the cards and nobody's actually even talking about that anymore. It had been a talking point a few years ago, but it's not anymore. So we acknowledge that we need a Syria-wide solution someday and yet we're so far from that that we're struggling to chart a course from the situation we're in right now to that long-term outcome. In some respects, the Turks have actually learned this lesson far better than the United States because it seems that the Turks acknowledge that this is going to be an iterative process, that they have to make advances on the ground, see what they can get with their leverage, and then return, if they need to, to future military operations. That's why we're seeing the Turks advance this deliberately up the escalation ladder with the Russians, as Charles mentioned, opting for a drone campaign against Syrian regime targets rather than a ground offensive. I don't think that means that no ground offensive will ever happen. I think that means we're at a lower rung right now of the escalation ladder. I raise this because the U.S. has decided to stay in the Northeast, which in my view is a very positive decision, and it acknowledges that we need some kind of indefinite presence, and we can't accept the alternatives. We can't accept the alternative of the Assad regime retaking Northeastern Syria and the Iranian expansion that will then follow. We can't accept the alternative, which is an inevitable ISIS resurgence, if U.S. forces withdraw. That's good. We've given our military forces a weird mission to secure the oil fields. It's sort of just an excuse to be present. That's important. It has helped keep the SEF aligned with the United States, as well as coherent in terms of the Arab components continuing to work with the Kurdish element. And that is an important starting point for an American re-engagement. But a re-engagement has to happen, because our current force posture is not sustainable, in my personal view, over the very long term. Now, the U.S. is benefiting in some respects, as is northeastern Syria, by the fact that the rest of the major power players in Syria right now are pretty focused on the northwest. This is the time, in my view, that we should be hammering out what the heck is our plan for building on that limited presence and creating from the northeast at least some kind of modicum of stability, actually, that can create momentum towards a new trajectory of the conflict. Does that mean defeating ISIS tomorrow? No. ISIS is already resurgent. Frankly, we're going to go through a whole round of combat operations against ISIS in the near future. We're not prepared to fight as an, insur as an insurgency, and that's exactly how ISIS is going to fight. So unfortunately, I still think that it is likely in the next few years that ISIS is going to make another land grab. We're watching them practice those tactics and exercise their forces in the central Syrian desert around Palmyra, and that is going to come east of the Euphrates River. But it's important to acknowledge that Syria is still actually a vacuum. The Assad regime's ability to project power to the Northeast was actually laughable when they sent what was basically a few, you know, trucks of rabble out there to try to be present in Raqqa and present in Tal Tamar and some other places. And the regime's ability to project military power into the Northeast has further degraded given the attrition that they have suffered in the Idlib campaign, as Charles mentioned. The Russians are increasingly present in the Northeast. 
and they're making a very big show about trying to interfere with U.S. presence patrols and to negotiate with the, the SDF for a potential future deal with the Assad regime. I personally don't think that deal with the Assad regime is going to happen. I think there's a lot of sort of, it's a form of wishful thinking to think that a deal is going to happen because it absolves us of the responsibility to figure out what to do. And I think there's still some of that legacy thinking in the U.S. military and some of the policy establishment that, well, if Bashar is going to win the war, then it's inevitable that the SDF is going to cut a deal at some point, And therefore, there's nothing we can do about it. That's not true. The U.S. still has an opportunity to do quite a bit in Syria. We should not only engage in the Northeast. We need to do something in Idlib. I'm happy to talk about that in Q&A um, at more depth. But I think the key point for us moving forward is how is the U.S. going to negotiate our relationship with Turkey, given all of the complexities, given the unacceptable, in my view, Turkish invasion of the Northeast, but then the reality of that the Turks have stepped in, stepped in into Idlib and owned a problem that nobody else in the world wants to even face with the greatest mass displacement of the Syrian war to date. We cannot back away from this challenge. The U.S. does have leverage. We do have an opportunity to do something. We just need to start getting creative and to find the resolve to take a step forward and to see what is achievable. There's no path from here to the end of the war right now. That can't be the goal. But we can re-engage. We can find a way to realign, in my view, with Turkey. And we can do more to work with the SDF to create a form of governance and security that is not only acceptable to the local population, is acceptable and consistent with American values, and I think could be acceptable to Turkey in some form in the long term. I'll end there because I know we're short on time, I'm, but happy to. I want to ask you the first okay. question, if you don't mind. So, if the United States is going to re engage, how would that be possible? Right now, we see that our foreign policy with regard to Syria is being directed by a very small number of people. James Jeffries, Joel Rayburn, Colonel Hudson. Beyond that, there doesn't seem to be much interest in the National Security Council, in the White House, or even in the Congress beyond Lindsey Graham and uh, Adam Kinzinger. How do we form a policy that makes sense? And as you said, you know, it's, it's wishful thinking to think that the SDF is going to be able to make a deal. Is the SDF? our right partner, particularly considering <coughs> that even the serious study group said that we've made a big mistake by having the major and controlling component of the SDF being YPG. Great question. Um, so I'll start by saying I, of course, have the benefit of being outside of government. Um, so my perspective is what objectively can the U.S. do with the resources that we have, with the capabilities that we have, and with the current sort of hand of cards that we are holding inside of Syria. And so objectively, my argument is there is a lot we could do if we could find the resolve, and if, to your point, we could get our act together here in Washington. Now, will we get our act together amidst the coronavirus and a presidential election? Probably not, unfortunately. I, I, see, I see Charles kind of shaking his head, and I can tell what's rolling around in his brain. Charles, do you have anything to say about that? <sighs> I'm shaking my head in part because we've, we've all watched for nine years with U.S. policy on two administrations try to grapple with this issue and consistently make more or less the same mistakes. But I think today we face an even worse situation, which is that domestic issues are, are I mean, coronavirus is about to become a major domestic crisis in this country. Uh, if you hear, listen to the way that some health experts are talking, this might be the biggest challenge since World War II. Um, for U.S. domestic resilience. Uh, in that climate, every single other issue in the world will drop to of negligible importance. Um, and even today, I mean, I'm, I have great respect for Ambassador Jeffrey. He, compared to I think every single one of his predecessors, has, um, in a number of different directions, thrown a great deal more energy into trying to energize a Syria policy. Um, and, and some people uh, disagree with what he's doing, but a policy nonetheless, um, compared to any of his predecessors. But the White House is, uh, has had such a high turnover of Syria directors, and the most recent one I know very well left. Uh, he's at the State Department now. Um, and without someone in the White House who is both capable, knows the issue, and has the ear of the Vice President and the President, there is going to be no significant Syria policy change, 
energization or anything. So we have to have faith that Ambassador Jeffrey can do as much as he can. Um, let's, let's, but, ask, let's ask Hassan about that because you raise a very important point. Coronavirus, is it a problem for Syria or is it an opportunity to change our Syria policy? Because Iran is currently being hit by it very hard and will continue to suffer from it. And how will coronavirus, do you anticipate, expect, uh, affect Syria and what goes on there? So I don't know, but the one thing I learned is that the more you talk about Syria, uh, the worse the policy gets. Mm -hmm. Because uh, the, the uh, one trick to do is to stop people from talking about Syria and then let the policymakers understand what's going on in reality and sort of, sort of try to do some good things on the ground. We saw, the, we saw this every time there's a, a kind of a, a, a kind of a peak in the conversation about Syria. Uh, people like Trump want to uh, want to just leave Syria, for example, because they know the kind of the, this is the kind of the reflex uh, in the country. So coronavirus might detract, uh, kind of uh, distract from Syria, which is a good thing. Are you are you saying that the Washington narrative yeah. is really controlling in our policy? Way. Sorry? Are you saying the Washington narrative is controlling? Yeah, I mean, the, so driving I, U.S. policy. Terms? No, seriously, this is uh, there is this is kind of for the state of the conversation about Syria today. Uh, we saw recently uh, certain articles coming out uh, out of Syria saying, for example, uh, let's leave Syria because of that battle, that fight uh, between Russia and Turkey it has nothing to do with the U.S., but because. Some people at state try to take advantage of the situation, maybe um, get Turkey to re-engage Turkey a little bit, and that meant uh, that meant uh, you know a, a kind of re-energize re re the wrong people, where they start to come out and say you know uh, let's leave Syria because they didn't want to deal, they didn't want to kind of spend that, uh, they don't have the bandwidth uh, for that, and what what that tells us is that. Uh, the, it seems like consensus, the, the, the things that are accepted about Syria and anything else, not just Syria, uh, we saw that also with Qasem Soleimani, because uh, something came out in the news, uh, the natural reaction, the normal reaction, the reflex is that, oh, uh, let's just leave the Middle East or let's leave Syria or leave Iraq or something like that. That's really the, the only option that seems to energize a lot of people. Qasem, let me ask you a follow-up question. That the Quincy Institute here here in Washington, D.C. It's a new enterprise. It's funded by, I guess, the Koch brothers, or the Koch brothers, and George Soros, and led by Sarah Lee Whitson. And she, she had a very interesting tweet, uh, or several tweets the other day. She's the director. Um, are you familiar with those? Yes. What, what did you think of those? What did what they say, that? and what was your response? Sorry, well, uh, the, I wasn't familiar with the tweets. She, she essentially said that, well, not all 1.5 million Syrians are going to die in it. Obviously, she's wrong about the number of Syrians in Idlib, since it's more like 4 million. And two, she's formerly from Human Rights Watch, and she's driving the discussion, the narrative today in Washington, and she's okay with a million, 500,000 Syrians dying in Idlib. Is that the narrative that's driving the policy for Washington now? Right. So on that, I think you should give me one minute to explain because this is a this goes beyond uh, this. So I'm not commenting on the tweets themselves, but there's a deeper issue, which is that you know people, a lot of people talk about Syria in terms of sectarianism between you know, Shia and Sunni, uh, Alawites and Sunnis, and so on and so forth. But uh, beyond this, the kind of the, the internal dynamics in Iran, uh, sectarianism did play a role in Syria, where people outsiders. Looked at the Assad regime as sort of uh, uh, a leader of minorities. Uh, they looked at the rebels as I don't want to generalize, but I think a lot of people who are who, who favor Bashar Assad, at, not all of them, but a lot of them have at least a degree of sectarianism. The way they look at the uh, at, at the series, they see, oh, these guys do not deserve our sympathy. Let the Assad regime crush them. If one third of them get killed, that's fine. Uh, goes back to uh, an extremist fatwa in, in the Middle East where they say uh, in a war, if uh, one third uh, of the population gets killed, that's fine uh, because the rest will uh, live happily ever after. So it seems like this is a policy uh, take. Uh, uh, ser seriously, this seems to be, if you look deeper than just what people make in arguments and they have, uh, you know, the way they argue about this point, it does boil down to how people perceive 
uh, the rebels. They look at them and all jihadists, all extremists, they bought into this Russian narrative that anyone who opposes Bashar al-Assad is at least a Sunni nationalist uh, or an Islamist or uh, an extremist or a jihadist, you know, so uh, pick your uh, poison. That's kind of the, uh, the, uh, the way they look at it. Um, but, you know, nine years we kind of... The, the UAE is pushing some of that in Saudi Arabia as well, and they probably... That book, that anti Muslim Brotherhood. Jen, can you comment? You don't know what that Well, is. I don't know in the specifics of who's funding any of that, but I'm happy to comment on the broader political discussion. Yeah, the broader. Well, why don't we? I'm going to ask you to do your thing, Jenny. I, I have your work up on the, uh, the screen behind us. And I mean, one of the things that I think most people have a difficulty understanding there are so many acronyms SDF, YPG, PKK, SNA, SNC, SDC. It really gets a bit confusing. And you know, Albert Einstein said best, if you can't explain it simply, then you don't know your topic well enough. And I know you're ta you know your topic well enough, and that's your work right up there. Can you explain for everybody using the map? What is what there? Where is the Euphrates? Where is the M4? What's northeast? What's northwest? Where is Gold And where's the and where is Turkey on that map? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Do that for us? Yes, I'm happy to do that. I'm going to make one quick comment on the question of U.S. policy, and then I'll jump into the map. The quick comment is just to reinforce something I said earlier, which is, are we doomed if the U.S. doesn't figure out a Syria policy right now? And I raise that because, again, we're so desperate for positive change or an end to this war that we often dismay if it's not happening right now. I don't think we're going to get a better Syrian policy before this election is over. I hope that I'm wrong about that, but we're not doomed if we fail to figure this out right now because Syria is going to remain a vacuum. And that's heartbreaking, but it means that there is no reason to give up hope right now. We will have an opportunity to re-engage because none of the actors on this battlefield, which I am now going to explain, actually have the ability to end this war or to reach any kind of diplomatic agreement that has a chance of ending this war. That's just the reality that we're in. So who are the actors? All right, we have in purple, in the far northeast, in the darkest purple. Okay. Oh, right there. Yep. So these are, so the dark purple here are basically shades of the complexities of the U.S. partner force, the Syrian Democratic Forces, which is a coalition of both Kurdish forces, the YPG, uh, which is the Syrian affiliate of the PKK, which is a terrorist organization, which are concentrated for the most part in the darkest darkest purple areas, which are very broadly Kurdish majority areas, um, but are forward deployed into Arab majority areas in order to do counter ISIS operations in the lighter shade of purple. Where this is east of the Euphrates. East of the Euphrates River, yep, and some areas just south of the Euphrates River um, around Raqqa, where primarily Arab elements of the Syrian Democratic Forces are deployed. Now, those Arab elements are a very important element of the U.S. partner force in Syria that, in my view, gets sort of underplayed. There's a lot of focus on the Kurds. There's far less focus on the Arab component, which, in my view, should actually be separated out from the Kurdish component and, and receive its own support and funding, et cetera. Because and the U.S. government is doing that now? The U.S. government is not really doing that. I mean, we're making some noise about doing that. We are present and we're working with those partners and we're doing very limited forms of support to those Arab elements, but we haven't yet committed nearly the scale of the sort of resources um, or the U.S. involvement that would be necessary to do more with that Arab force. We're far too reliant on the Kurdish force. Um, the regime held areas on this map are the pink color. That's probably, candidly, the most overly simplified piece of this map. We've struggled over the years with different options for what are we going to try to show on this map. And I think this is the one we're going to try to spend some attention on in 2020 because the regime, Syrian regime forces, control very little of Syria. Independently. Let, me, let, me, let me stop you at that point okay. for just a second. This portion down here, mm -hmm. this is southern Syria. Mm -hmm. And is that controlled by Assad or Russia or the rebels or Israel? Well, not Israel, so not we can work Israel. backwards from that. Excellent. Southwest Syria is controlled by what we tend to refer to at ISW as pro-regime forces. What does that mean? It's a matrix. It includes Syrian units that have become Russian proxies, Syrian units that have become Iranian proxies, in many cases commanded by Russians and commanded by Iranians, but made up of Syrians, with, in some cases, overlapping sort of uh, patronage networks or forms of support. This is one of the reasons why analyzing what's going to happen in Syria is so complicated, right? Because it's difficult to identify who actually controls anything. 
And therefore, what leverage does Bashar have over the Iranians? What leverage does the Iranians have over Bashar? Well, that corner of northwest Syria is where the Iranians have continued to prioritize their effort to build out local Syrian proxy forces. Will they succeed over the long term? That's unclear. The Israelis are doing a lot of damage to that Iranian proxy network in southwestern Syria. It's disrupting that effort by Iran. But you can't destroy that kind of an Iranian campaign from the air alone. So Iran's efforts to get very deep social roots in that part of Syria are going to continue. And unfortunately, in my view, for the stability of this area, as well as for the, the population there uh, more broadly, is likely to continue this, this Iranian campaign. But the Iranians are not only concentrated in the southwest. We talk about that a lot. But they, of course, are deployed all along uh, the western bank of the Euphrates River in eastern Syria. Now, there was a time when we at the Institute for the Study of War were thinking through what are the possible escalation scenarios between Iran's proxy forces and the IRGC across the river if they decided to make a military push against U.S. forces in the east. I mentioned that because Iran is in some ways struggling in Syria right now due to the economic pressure, but still has kinetic military options. And we may actually see them decide to use those east of the Euphrates River. And so that diverse and diffused Iranian proxy network across this sort of uh, red swath of terrain is important to keep in mind because the Iranians have freedom of movement, which means they can transit pretty much any, any portion of that. And they can shift military resources from battlefront to battlefront if they need to. So we need not to get complacent and expect that the Iranians are just focused on the Golan Heights and just focused in southwest Syria where the Israelis can maybe handle it but recognize that the Iranians actually can decide to sort of lift and shift their forces if they decide to make a main effort elsewhere. Okay, I'll answer one more question okay. about this map. I, I notice here that the bulk of it is actually ISIS support zones, and it's what? <laughs> Undefined. Is it, when, you, when you look at this map and then switch to the map that we had up previously with the Iranian flag on it, that one right there, And this wasn't prepared by you, obviously. And I'm not saying this is particularly accurate or yours is accurate. Okay. I'm afraid we're one another by now. But I noticed that there's. It says well, I'm not, so that's the difference. well, there's a big difference there, of course. But the part that interests me is this map says this is controlled by Iran, Russia, the southern Syria part. And there's been a lot of activity there. Uh, there's still insurgent activity there. I think you see the article that Assad doesn't control this. Is, would that be accurate? Well, I think you're raising a very important question, which is what do we mean by control? In a military sense, full control should mean the ability to exclude any sort of opposing parties from operating in that zone. In that respect, the Turks don't even control anything. Would it be fair they say, can't exclude, for example, ISIS sleeper cells from operating in Turkish-controlled areas either. So every part of Syria is actually in some way unstable. We're talking about shades of instability here. So would it be fair to say that nowhere on this map Whoever prepared this map, they didn't even bother to list Assad. Right. And on your map, you listed Assad, but so little of it is shaded in areas that Assad actually controls. So, Hassan, is Assad winning or losing? Uh, I think we have to be realistic. Assad has won uh, the military war uh, in the sense that, especially since 2016, there's no way someone will down, uh, bring down the Assad regime. Uh, not even, even if you, I think a lot of people kind of anticipate that in the future there will be a lot of uprisings within the Assad regime by the Alawites and by the other Islamists that live under the Assad regime. But this will be uh, akin to the protests that are taking place in Baghdad and uh, central Iraq and, and southern Iraq against the government, which is much more fragile and uh, kind of a, as a as a state security, a kind of a state, uh, a state structure. So I don't think the Assad regime will ever face the same challenge, not ever, but like in the foreseeable future, the same challenge that it faced in 2011, 12, 13, and 14. Uh, but that uh, is not, you shouldn't be reassured because there are still other problems. And um, if you look at the map from Idlib uh, in the northwest uh, to Kamashli, and near the, the, the Turkish uh, areas, down to Deir uh, Zor and Bukhamad, all the way to Daraa. This is an area that everyone has to keep in mind, even if Assad takes control uh, of all of Syria. Uh, 
because this is what I call the, the kind of the vulnerable arc of Syria. There will always be uh, troubles in these areas because, uh, as Jen, uh, Jenny uh, explained earlier, um, when the Assad regime takes control of an area, it's usually really more like planting the flag than real control. So uh, uh, you have to keep in mind, this is, the, this is how the dynamic works on the ground. The Assad regime takes over, they claim they take this area, but the, 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 the village or the town is pacified for, for, for the time being. Why is it uh, pacified? Because the rebels and the sleeper cells and the other uh, forces that could challenge the Assad regime in that area is either out, been out for the time being, or uh, focus on uh, the last battle in Egypt, for example. Maybe they are focused there. But once uh, uh, the situation stabilizes uh, along these lines, you will start to see some, this is something we've seen in other conflicts in Afghanistan, in Iraq. You can easily see how the uh, scenario will uh, play out, but it will take years. So the Assad regime, on one hand, will uh, always uh, claim control of Syria, uh, but not the same Syria that, uh, that had control uh, before 2011. There will be other forces. Uh, uh, there will be even internal challengers within their militia, the Assad regime's militia, Iran, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is how I see the situation long term. Charles, I know that you've seen this article. I'm going to ask you to comment on it. This is an article that essentially says that Turkey has demonstrated escalation dominance over Syria. When it, before, before Turkey went into the Northwest, there were a lot of military analysts that were saying that Turkey's military is approximately equal in strength to Syria's, to Assad's army. And I think that we saw that that was very untrue. Is their swarm technology or their drones that they've used giving them such an advantage that they could do much more in Syria? Where, where do you see this going? It's an interesting question, the answer of which depends on lots of ifs and buts. But, um, I mean, Turkey was capable of doing what it's done or what it did from... 1st of March till 5th or 6th of March, largely because Russia took a step back and didn't stop, didn't stop Turkey's uh, drones from flying in the air, didn't stop Turkey's artillery systems from providing uh, sort of standoff support to, to opposition proxies fighting on the ground. If Russia had stepped in, we would have seen a very, a very different um, set of developments take place. Um, and... Turkey remains the largest standing army in NATO, so there's a great deal it can do in terms of, uh, of ground uh, warfare, um, amassing tanks, armored vehicles. We haven't seen a great deal of that in, 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 this, uh, in this case. What we really saw was, I think, and this is really, a, I mean, if anyone reads it, there's an article on Drusi um, from London. I mean, it's a, it's a pretty um, granular military analysis of what, uh, what the drone campaign means for the value of deploying tanks in battle. Uh, the title is Your Tanks Can't Hide. I mean, for me, that was the main takeaway. And that has global implications, less so necessarily for Syria. But uh, deploying tanks across open ground um, leaves you vulnerable to any force that has planes or drones in the sky. Uh, and I think that's, that's the most significant takeaway. Um, yes, sitting in DC, uh, it's, it's somewhat frustrating that we've heard, um, frankly, from both administrations, but particularly from the DOD. Um, that it would have been, and throughout the conflict, impossible to uh, use air assets in Syria without potentially being shot down um, by the Syrian uh, Arab army, not, uh, not Russia. Um, and I think clearly Turkey using drones, i.e. not losing manpower in flying over Syrian territory, um, sort of proved that, that argument wrong. Can I just say one thing about... Um, say it very so um, oh, now I forgot what it was. It was a, I had so many things to say after all of the discussion that preceded it. Um, but uh, just on U.S. policy, um, no, no, I'll leave that. I'll leave it to this. I've been passed a note saying that we're going to take questions, uh, uh, verbal questions, instead of uh, written questions. So I think I'm going to start right here from this esteemed and honorable gentleman to my right. Hello, Anishik from Turkish Embassy. Thank you very much for our presentation. Now, what we saw during the Idlib uh, events, let's say, STC made a statement in support of the regime in Italy and condemned Turkey with their meaning in Italy. At the same time, 
they increase their bomb attacks onto the civilians in the city centers in uh, the liberated areas in the north. So how do you put it? I mean, where, 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 where do you put it? Discover it. Sure. Thank you for the question. Um, I'll start by saying something that I've, I've said at previous panels before, which is I think that the U.S. has decided to involve ourselves in Syria enough to be held accountable, I think rightly, for the outcome in areas such as northeastern Syria. But we haven't involved ourselves, involved ourselves enough actually to determine that outcome. It's the worst place to be. So the expression that comes to mind is the tail is wagging the dog, which is that our local partner, partner the SDF, is out ahead of us, has been out ahead of us making decisions since, frankly, we intervened in 2014 because the U.S. did not have a fully fledged policy. As a result, the SCF, for example, moved forward with a governance project that I have personally been quite critical of because it's destabilizing and not just because it has led in part to Turkey's decision to intervene. And we haven't fixed, we the U.S. haven't fixed that problem. We're, we scaled back further our operations, which means, yeah, we're very vulnerable to our local partner deciding, for example, if the Kurdish YPG is conducting what amount to terrorist attacks in areas claimed by Turkey. That, in my view, is completely unacceptable for an American local partner to do. Now, I can't confirm that from unclassified sources, but there has been a bombing campaign, which we have published about, in areas that the Turks have seized, and it's a very big problem. It's a huge problem. Because again, the U.S. is not fully in control. That's not going to end well. Now, the challenge is that's in some ways a military problem. So I've been quite quite critical of our Defense Department for some of the the decisions that it has made. Um, but at the root of it, this is about civilian leadership here in the United States making the wrong calls. And in this uh, case abdicating the responsibility to come up with a plan for what we were going to do beyond take down the physical caliphate. It's not the Defense Department's job to figure that out. It's the civilian leadership's job. They failed. And it's, it's far past time that they actually re-engage. Will they? Again, unfortunately, I'm not sure. But I think we're headed for another period of instability in Syria driven by many actors if the U.S. doesn't figure this out. I don't think that's acceptable. I think that we have, in my personal view, an opportunity in Idlib I hope that we take it to re-engage with Turkey. I think there needs to be conditions. I think it's time for the U.S. and the Turks to find a way to resolve some of these differences. And I fully expect that our local partner, the Syrian Democratic Forces, might not like that. And they might not have a choice. Or they have choices. It includes go be subordinate to Bashar, which I don't think, frankly, they're actually going to enjoy. I think that's one of the reasons why Muslim... Uh, the commander of the YPG actually hasn't accepted that deal. It's not in his interest at the end of the day. So we have a very long road to go. Um, I think it's important that these attacks, which do include attacks on marketplaces, get in investigated. Is it ISIS? Could it be Al-Qaeda cells? Is it the YPG conducting terrorist bombings? I think it's a very important issue that, that definitely needs far more attention than it actually has received here in Washington. John, can I ask you a follow-up question? This is, uh, there isn't a lot of data on this. Uh, but up uh, on the screen behind us, there is a map showing the ethnic makeup mm. of Syria. And I'm not so sure I agree with it completely, but uh, we've heard in the media here, in Europe, elsewhere, these areas called the Kurdish areas mm. or Kurdish lands. And from what I see here, there is no area, um, even in the Northeast, where there's a population that even approaches 50% of Kurds. Why are they always referred to as Kurdish areas? Sure, it's a good question. Um, I, of course, don't have a set of data that I could offer you for what is the actual percentage. This is one of the most hotly debated and contested topics, actually, um, inside of Syria. And I would submit to you, anybody that says they know for sure probably shouldn't be trusted. So I stepped um, into a landmine with that question. I'm love gonna, it, but I'm gonna I'll, still answer okay. it. I'm gonna okay. still answer okay. it. I think it's an important question because you're raising an unknown. The reason it's referred to as Kurdish areas, though, is because there are Kurdish civilians that live there. And it is claimed by our local partner as Syrian Kurdistan. So the U.S. tends to simply refer to, to adopt the language of our partner, right, where it is Kurdistan that is at stake in Syria. I, in some ways, think that that's misleading because the YPG, for example, is not the only Kurdish party inside of Syria. There have been Kurdish members, as, as both Charles and Hassan have published and spoke about repeatedly, there are Kurdish members of the Syrian opposition that opposes the YPG. The YPG jails political dissidents, including Kurds. 
So I think we refer to it, US media and policymakers often refer to it because it is such an issue, and frankly, because we don't yet have an answer to it, but also because the Turkish campaign has deliberately displaced Kurdish civilians from their homes, and that is actually unacceptable behavior by a NATO ally, and it's another reason why it factors so heavily into the public discussion. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, sir? Okay, Stanley Cover. About a week or two ago, um, the Israeli Defense Minister Bennett told the Jerusalem Post, I have placed the goal that within 12 months, Iran will leave Syria. We will remove Iran from Syria. What are the implications of that? Uh, are you directing it to anyone? Anyone to anyone wants to answer it. I think Charles wants to answer it. Well, um, I mean, that's that's not a new policy line from Israel or the existing administration. Um, the line for a long time has been Iran will be forced away out of Syria. Uh, I, think, I think what we also know, I think what we also know is um, from, from practical realities, though, is that when when the Israelis have engaged in, in back channel negotiations on this issue, they've been willing to compromise. Uh, whether it's 30 kilometers, 80 kilometers uh, from, from Israeli territory, those lines have, have been um, in back channels drawn on a map. Uh, they're also not being met. Um, but this brings me back to one of the things I did want to raise from, from the earlier discussion, which is I'm, I'm not so convinced the Iranians are suffering quite so much. Um, Iranians entered nearly two years ago an entirely different phase of, of operating in Syria where military frontline intensive operations weren't the priority anymore. They had achieved their strategic objectives. The Lebanese border was shored up. Uh, the Euphrates, uh, as Jenny described, um, sort of frontline had been drawn. Um, the regime had been rescued in, in tight coordination with, uh, with Russia. Um, and the remaining frontline in Idlib uh, has never been a strategic priority for the Iranians. Uh, I know it from senior Russian government officials that the Iranians had consistently said in Astana and Sochi and all of their various meetings, we will not play a role in Italy. It's not a priority for us. It wasn't a matter of whether or not they had the money or the manpower. Um, it was purely a prioritization issue. I think what was fascinating is just in the last week or so, we did start to see the Iranians on the front line in Italy. And I think that tells you a lot about the impact that the Turkish campaign had. Um, but, but Iran is in a consolidation phase. Uh, in the southwest, they don't have huge numbers of Iranians or Iraqi Shia or Hezbollah. They're recruiting Sunni Syrians uh, to join um, resistance militias. We're seeing them pivot back to the pre-2011 posture. Um, and that is, that is a much uh, more difficult challenge for Israel to, to, to face. Um, they're facing an explicitly sectarian uh, Shia uh, force, which is what they faced since 2011. Um, so, short answer is we'll continue to hear those lines coming out of, of, of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. Um, it does definitely does not mean we're going to see them realized. Thank you. Uh, gentleman in the back, and then Chad. I'm Peter Humphrey, an intelligence analyst, a former diplomat. Um, I taught military strategy, and the one thing you learn is you want to move the situation in your direction. You go out to the Clausewitzian center of gravity, which in this case is Al Assad. Um, I'm tired of years of magical thinking that this is going to end without the uh, deposition of that tribe. Why is that not even on the hearing screen of any party? Why is the adult supervision in this situation? Thank you, sir. And you directing it to anyone to person? I think uh, Jennifer and Charles. Can I make sure I understand the question? She wants to know why we don't just take out Assad. <laughs> well, according to some reports, right? the president has considered doing it. So if I were Bashar, I wouldn't be sleeping so well, uh, especially after the strike on Qasem Soleimani. I would say I think the reason, look, I don't know, right? I have to speculate. I'm not in the room for those discussions. But I think it's reasonable for the United States to be cautious. Uh, and for the other states to be cautious as well, because nobody knows what would happen if Bashar al-Assad was assassinated. A lot of people can speculate, but nobody it would create a huge vacuum. Yep, yeah, I know. But you ask, why hasn't why haven't we done it? And I'm submitting to you that the fear of the unknown and the greater instability 
is the primary reason why we haven't done it. Now, is that the right decision? I don't know, candidly. But I think that we also have to keep in mind that it is only recently that the Syrian capital has been reasonably secure. And it actually may not be secure for long. And so it is very valid for U.S. officials to have expected in 2014, for example, that a decision to strike the Assad regime, including a decision that would have killed Bashar potentially, could create an opening for a group like ISIS to do something really terrible to the population in Damascus or to, to engage in some kind of breakout offensive. It's actually responsible for the U.S. to consider those kinds of contingencies and to ensure that our decision-making process does not make reckless decisions and instead accounts for those unknowns and, and does the best that we can to balance these, balance these risks. But the last thing I'll say is the challenge in Syria is that the risks, there are so many risks. There are so many forms of uncertainty that we're choosing always, in my personal view, we're choosing between bad options. So the question is, what is the least bad option for the United States and Syria and for our Syrian partners and the Syrian civilians who deserve far better than they've received? Just briefly, I mean, I, I don't think this is all about Bashar. Um, I think if there's anything we've learned over the last nine years is that this, the, both Hafez and Bashar had created a system you can call it the regime, you can call it the state, you can call it the deep state, whatever term you want to use, they had created a system that was incredibly robust when faced by existential challenge. Um, and it's speculation, because uh, it's impossible not to speculate when asked a question like this, but I don't think killing Bashar would change a great deal. I think we would see a week of chaos in, ba in, in, Baghdad, in Damascus, Sorry, I was speaking on Iraq yesterday. I'm still uh, transitioning. Um, you'd see a, a week of uncertainty, uh, speculation um, in Damascus. But I would be amazed if there wasn't some form of a plan um, uh, for transition, whether it is a concrete plan on, plan on paper or something that has been discussed in quiet, in whispers before. Um, but it's it's principally it's not Bashar that has caused all of this. It's the regime he created. It is everything that it stands for: the, the yeah. intelligence services and directorates, the military, the sectarian design of the state, who holds the power, who holds the wealth, what the political and diplomatic relationships are that Damascus depends on to survive. All of those things are our problems and our obstacles. It's not just the head of the snake. Could I could I add to that? Because I think it's such an important point. And i just like to emphasize that the U.S., from a political standpoint, in my view, also focuses too much on Bashar, right? We need to get Bashar al-Assad out, and then peace is possible in Syria. And I think Charles's point is very valid. Holding war criminals accountable in Syria requires much going much, much, much deeper than Bashar al-Assad. And the U.S. has never really been able to think through what that requires. But it has always been a focus of the Syrian opposition, which understands this quite well and understand that this regime is not going to stop killing them, even if we did manage to send Bashar al-Assad to the Hague, which is where he deserves to be. On, on a positive note, today was the uh, start of the trial uh, yeah. for the first war criminals, Syrian war criminals. So there, there is good reason to be optimistic. Uh, further questions? Uh, Sarah? Uh, can I ask from... I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Sarah, I, I actually, I forgot to yes, chat. Sure. So Chad and Ensor, I'm sorry. So uh, Chad Brown, Sir, Member of Council. Uh, love, love what I hear. Um, Jennifer, to your point about talking about that there is room for re-engagement in terms of things that the U.S. can do with Turkey in terms of dealing with it. So mm -hmm. this is my main focus here uh, about Idlib in terms of for all three. What would you specifically recommend the United States do? <coughs> because these are the kinds of things that we do our advocacy on the Hill, and I've done a lot of it just in the last few weeks. We've been trying to dust off the idea, given Senator Graham's position about let's have an fly zone mm -hmm. or some kind of safe zone. Because technically, if you look at the ground work, what the Turks have achieved is through their army, it's established a technical safe zone. Now, there's still some violence going on, it's Charles Moore's out, but the level of violence has decreased. As long as that holds, it can be built upon by doing an fly zone. One of the options are that it needs to be solidified the gains on the ground. It makes it more difficult for Assad. And Russia to break that ceasefire. Yeah, I totally agree. It's going to break itself. Sure. So uh, I'll start. I don't think we can stop the regime and Russia from breaking the ceasefire. They're going to break the ceasefire. It's a matter of time, in my view. Well, it, it's sort of not even really a ceasefire already. Um, but to your point, the Turks have stepped in to own this problem in Italy. 
and they have established a secure zone, some kind of secure. We can debate the level to which the Turks are in control, but they've sent reportedly 20,000 troops to Italy. I mean, this is a huge NATO deployment. It gets me back to the point about the Russians on this map, by the way, because it looks like Russia is controlling southwestern Syria, and I think it's just important to note these are apples and oranges. Right, and I, I, the reason I chose that map is because it's the exact opposite. Yeah, no, it's provocative, and, and it's helpful. And it's actually, it's actually a debatable point. Who were they with? For sure, absolutely. I, I think it's a very helpful graphic to that end, and the reason I wanted to raise that is because the Turks have given the U.S. an opportunity to do something that, that we were never going to do alone. And I think that it's time that the U.S. step in and do that. I think we should be providing robust humanitarian support, including with an emphasis on kits and whatever humanitarian assistance is necessary to prepare for a coronavirus outbreak, which frankly I think is a matter of time amidst this population. So I would put health and sanitation at the very top. It was already mentioned, the U.N. does not have the financial resources necessary to accommodate this population. We should be stepping in. We pledge $108 million. It's not nearly enough. It's time to do far more. I also personally am, am willing to argue that we should, in fact, provide the Turks the military support they've requested for the no-fly zone, including Patriot missile systems, air defense, with some conditions. My conditions are as follows. First, give back or destroy the Russian S-400 system. Two, leave the Astana process. It does no good for Syria. It's actually doing relatively little good for the Turks, and time for Turkey to realign with NATO in return for this robust support inside of Idlib. And three, re-engage with the United States in a framework for negotiations over the Northeast, which can be a very iterative process, but we need to restart aligning. Only then, in my view, is it possible, even politically, for the U.S. to marshal the kind of support here in Washington and with the American people, et cetera, that would be necessary to do what needs to be done in Idlib and to do what the Turks have now created the opportunity for the U.S. with our European partners to finally do. And, uh, Sarah, I think you're next. Um, President Trump mentions frequently securing oil. Um, is it domestic reasons behind that, or what is the importance of that oil income uh, in terms of U.S. Syria policy? Does anyone want to answer that question? You ask Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's purely domestic. I mean, it's it's not even domestic. It's 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 what's his it's what's in his head. And to put it really bluntly, it's what systems within the U.S. government could do to convince him to stay in Syria. I want to add just my own thoughts on that. He's of a particular generation that is accustomed to talking about oil. So whether this is a policy or whether it was a tool to convince him of a policy, I think is almost kind of a circular what does that thing. What is that you call uh, basically? I'm sorry? And oil income. Mind you. Negli that, negligible. It's worth, almost worthless. We have very For us, for the U.S. So we really do. Well, it's, it's, we're not, we're not taking the income. Or, the no, we're not. Yeah. It's funding. It's funding. It's funding. just a slogan that he uses. It's, uh, I think it's inspired by the kind of, it's an anti-Obama sort of uh, token point. That oil is sold to the regime. That, yeah. yeah. That, uh, yeah. So it's taking the revenue from that Iran and producing Iran. revenue elsewhere. So if it's only a talking point, why are they clashing with Russian soldiers around these oil fields? I mean, if it's just a talking point, it's a generational sort of rhetoric moment. Why is there actual like it's not conflict? Just a, so it's not just a talking on. point. There is yeah. a policy going on uh, after the defeat of ISIS uh, almost exactly a year ago, uh, but also before, to stay in eastern Syria, to stabilize the region, to prevent the return of ISIS. This is the sound policy that the uh, the United States and um, you know anyone who really watches this version on the ground uh, subscribe to, uh, to and uh, that's why uh, the Americans continue to stay in Syria, uh, in, in that one third of Syria. So you're saying he's using so, the oil as a, an excuse to keep exactly, soldiers in exactly, there. Exactly, because uh, like you said, every time there's a debate, public debate about Syria, the only word that comes up is leave Syria. And he said it twice because that's the kind of impulse, uh, and uh, that resonates more. But then they, he was convinced when he uh, presented with the, or the, when he was presented with the uh, with the fact that leaving Syria would be a disaster, would be a repeat of what Obama, President Obama, did in 2011. Uh, so uh, he didn't want to leave. Uh, he didn't do basically. He didn't want to be 
uh, do what Obama did and, that, and be blamed for Syria and return of ISIS. But also at the same time, he wanted to take credit for taking the oil, which he criticized Obama didn't do in Iraq when he left Iraq without the oil. So that's kind of the logic for it. Thank you, Hassan. Logic. Uh, so I think you had a question next. Uh, yeah, I do. This was the first time. Um, I had a question about what happens to the jihadist groups if they've been paused or by some mechanism Turkey forces them. In particular, the central Asian groups. Are you asking? Oh, okay. In particular, the the well, just the jihadist groups that are there. HDS for us out there, and then the central Asia TIP. Do do they stay in Syria? Do they go to Afghanistan? Do they do an insurgency in Syria? What do you guys think? Well, we saw with the ISIS, like I said, uh, when they lost Baruz uh, a year ago, March last year, uh, exactly, almost a year ago, um, they just uh, disappeared in the desert. Uh, what well, they were, were left to them. Not everyone, uh, most of them went to the camps, uh, the whole camp, the other camps um, in Eastern Syria, and basically they were surrendered to the to the Kurds. Uh, the rebels surrendered to Bashar Assad. That's kind of a whole different story. Uh, but some of them, the hardcore sort of the diehard, uh, went to the desert, and uh, and they there there are places there like there's uh, places in Iraq, uh, Western Iraq, Eastern Iraq, uh, and Central Iraq, and as well as Syria, uh, you know, uh, near Palmyra, the Syrian Badia. Uh, these are all areas that uh, uh, ISIS disappeared into. Uh, in the case of the rebels, there's Central Syria and some of the mountains area in the north. Uh, if the, the commanders and uh, fighters, they can disappear there for, for a few years, uh, especially considering this uh, reality that when Bashar Assad, when uh, the Assad regime takes over in areas, it's not always a kind of a, a very solid uh, presence in that area, so you can still see people moving around um, until basically they regroup, until they start to kind of take over and uh, create safe havens for themselves to, in those areas. To be clear, the reason he's asking the question is they cannot go back to China. That's that's why he's asking that question. I assume. Uh, next question. Uh, sir, you're in the back. Do you want to talk? Near Bomb still a bit of a university. Mainly for, for Jennifer. Uh, the regime and pro-regime color in this map, I think, is a little seems to indicate a little decrease in, according to some previous maps that I've seen in the level of influence of uh, the Assad and pro-Assad forces. I just wonder if that's really just an impression, or this is really something that that begins to begins to see in the context of whatever, however you define effective control. And in this context, I wonder if any of you can comment on the how many Syri What's your take on how many Syrians are there now in Syria, and what's the actual uh, scale and scope of the uh, Syrian military and pro regime forces? First of all, hi. Thanks for coming. Thank you for your question. Uh, so our map is, as all Syrian maps are, an imperfect visualization of a very complex reality. Um, what we've done here is choose to show basically uninhabited parts of the Syrian desert as simply white, as, as if nobody controls them. And to focus our coloring of regime control on the actual logistics routes and population centers that they are using for logistics routes and, and operating within, if not fully controlling, for populated centers. As you can see, we've overlapped ISIS support zones on regime held areas. That's supposed to be provocative because the regime cannot exclude ISIS from operating in these zones, and that's actually where we're seeing ISIS resurge the fastest. That's a combination of regime interest in fighting ISIS and capability in fighting ISIS. Um, but of course, not just the regime, right? The areas around Palmyra and some of these oil and natural gas fields are also where Russian private military companies, including Wagner, um, are operating in order to extract their own concessions um, from those economic assets. So I would say right now we haven't we haven't substantively changed the overall regime coloring of this map. We've constricted it to those routes, um, but we're personally working through, and I know both both Hassan and Charles um, can speak on this as well. How to show the the rising insurgency in Dara, which hasn't yet taken physical terrain and held it for a long time but certainly demonstrates that by control, we're, we're putting that really in quotation marks. Um, similar, actually, in some respects to the way that the desert area around Palmyra is controlled in quotation marks uh, by the Assad regime, but contested by ISIS. In terms of how many Syrians are there, that's a great question, and I'd love to know. Um, 
I think I, I harp on this point that the Russian force posture in Syria is quite limited because I think it's important to acknowledge that the Russians are fighting this war basically to the last Syrian. They're avoiding Russian casualties as much as they can. Um, they're not even using Russian forces. They're trying to use Russian private military contractors because they can't even afford to take the casualties. Um, so it is Syrians that continue to, to bear the biggest brunt of this war. Um, but I think the, the Iranian foreign fighter uh, network is important not to lose sight of either because, of course, this is another form of social change inside of Syria if it, if it protracts uh, for the long term. Um, and unfortunately, I think it, it is likely to. I'm going to ask the last question since we only have 30 seconds or a minute left. Uh, if Russia's interest here is to remain to the last Syrian, and it's because Russia is tied to its interest and in investments in Syria, what is the fastest way to get Russia out of Syria or to prevent Russia from fighting to the last Syria? is to remove Assad? Well, I don't know. I, I personally don't know how removing Assad gets rid of Russia. Um, it might create a problem for Russia that Russia is not prepared to solve, but I agree with Charles's point that I, I think we need to be careful not to overestimate the effect of removing that one man. Um, I think the Russians may even actually have a contingency plan for that scenario for who they would like to see take that position. Um, but I do think it's important to acknowledge that the Russians are sort of operating on the surface of a Syrian regime, you know, set of institutions. And they're trying to build their own proxy forces, um, but that's still at a relatively early stage on the scale of things. Um, but I, I think we need to acknowledge that the Russians are not actually 10 feet tall in Syria. And frankly, I think the church has proved that. In fact, I would say uh, the best scenario <clears throat> for killing Bashar Assad would be that the regime manages to transition safely from one, uh, one uh, from Bashar Assad to another regime inside it. Uh, the worst case scenario, or probably a plausible scenario, is that a weakening state uh, of Syria, I mean, I'm against Bashar, obviously I criticize Bashar Assad, I'm against him, I don't think it's a good, good for Syria that he stays, uh, but the, in the absence of a grand, uh, real, a grand plan for Syria, uh, I, don't, I don't see him as an, I think his presence is, uh, his take out, like taking him out, would be benefiting one one country, which is Iran. Uh, and I think this is the dilemma that everyone has to grapple with in this in the U.S., which is yes, you have to weaken Bashar Assad. You have to make sure that Bashar Assad uh, 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 there is a transition in the future somehow. There has to be a grand strategy, plan, uh, long term plan. Uh, but in the absence of that of that plan, uh, the strength of the Assad regime is not in favor of Bashar uh, of, uh, of Iran. Uh, Iranian presence in Syria depends largely on the need for Bashar Assad uh, to rely on Iran. And this is something we saw in Lebanon and in Iraq. The two reasons why these two countries uh, were dominated by Iran is because Iran stepped in, uh, filled a void, uh, a void, a vacuum, and they strengthened themselves. This is not to say empower Bashar Assad, but to know that uh, in the absence of a grand strategy in Syria, uh, anyone who wants to uh, counter Iran uh, has to only think in that, in that limited thing, that maybe Bashar Assad's strength and getting stronger uh, will uh, eventually weaken Iran. The reason for that is that uh, if you speak to uh, Alawites, and I did, uh, who are part of the regime and uh, long-term uh, long insiders within the regime, they have this weird uh, nationalist pride that they built the army, they built the security forces, they built modern Syria, Basically, what they mean by that is that they built the regime. So when they start to see Hezbollah commanders with a little beard uh, coming into a secular country, uh, an Alawite-dominated secular, uh, uh, in the, like uh, in the way they, the, the, the political norms, and Iranian commanders who come and start step into their offices and tell them what to do, that uh, hurts their pride. And I saw, uh, we saw a lot of the you know Alawites leaving Syria or. Uh, uh, not, not everyone left Syria. Some of them just left Damascus and left, and then they went to their homes. They said, "You know what? We have nothing to do with it." Does, that doesn't make them in opposition, but it just needs, uh, uh, alienates them. So you have to kind of always look at this uh, at this reality that the Assad regime, the way it's uh, designed, is that it's uh, resistant to Iran uh, takeover. But that doesn't mean to go back to Charles' uh, idea is that Iran would go away. Iran would continue to be in Syria. It has gained from the Syrian presence, but. Uh, in my, in my opinion, uh, their potential for takeover of Syria and uh, growth in the region has saturated, has reached, has reached a point, has, uh, has reached a, a peak point for all the different factors that I laid out uh, 
I want to thank. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, so of course. Um, I think I think that the, the note Hassan ended on is, is, is exactly right. I think that's where we can, uh, in terms of this issue. Um, but but then again, I don't think Iran ever needed or necessarily even wanted total domination in Syria. I think where it is is exactly what suits it. Um, working largely under the surface of society, working within the regime, working within certain sectors of the security service. Is exactly where it wants to be. And in terms of Russia, I mean, Russia has done a great deal in Syria with very little, uh, largely because it's outbluffed every single other potential adversary that it's faced. Uh, and yes, you can argue that perhaps Turkey challenged that assumption or challenged that rule uh, over the last weeks. Although I don't think the outcome of the Moscow summit backs backs that particularly up. I think the Moscow summit seems to suggest Ankara gave some fairly big concessions. Um, but beyond that, you know, top line uh, closing comment is that Assad hasn't won uh, anything. I wrote, you know, eight, nine months ago in foreign policy, Assad hasn't won anything yet. Um, he has emerged as a dominant military actor, but what has he actually won in Syria? Uh, a totally broken state, a destroyed economy, a destroyed country, um, no prospect of meaningful reconstruction, almost total global isolation. Um, and a deep, deep, deep intrinsic dependence on foreign states to continue to survive. Um, and I think uh, whether you look at the South and the fact that there is definitely an insurgency rumbling there, albeit necessarily a small one, ISIS is resurgent in the Central Desert, and as Jenny said, is likely to eventually cross the Euphrates River into our areas. There will be a continued to and fro between the Turks and the Kurds for a long time to come. The opposition isn't just going to disappear, neither is Al-Qaeda. You know, all of these issues are going to present um, a huge challenge that the regime by itself is incapable of dealing with. And on the Iran point, I think that is where Iran will become newly more important again um, in terms of manpower, in terms of its ability to continue to recruit um, supplementary forces to deal with some of these issues. Because the Russians haven't shown much of a willingness to throw big metal into stabilizing these communities. They've deployed 100 military police to all of southern Syria. That's not a... Russian investment in stabilizing the South. But that is an area which Iran will want to see stable and where they have invested resources, but under the surface. And I think we'll start to see much more of that pattern develop um, over the next year or two. Thank you, Charles. Thank you to all of our panel speakers today. Thank all of you for coming out today. God bless you all, and Syria will be free. Thank you again. <laughs>